Welcome everyone to AIGA Design for Good webcast series. Today is our fourth webcast, and this program is um, supported by an award from the National Endowments for the Arts, as well as with uh, additional uh, support from um, IBM. Uh, today, our webcast is going to focus on uh, innovation in governments. Um, the Design for Good webcast series has tried to cover all the different initiatives that are happening at AIGA and trying to illustrate how we can understand this Design for Good in practice, whether it's through um, e dealing with issues related to women's rights, or it's about Social Impact 101, or it's about um, how designers function in urban communities. Today, we're going to focus on government innovation. And I'll start by introducing you uh, to one of our um, guests today on my right, Emily Herrick. Hi. Welcome, Thank Emily. You. Emily works at um, Reboot, um, a social impact firm in New York City that uh, self-describes itself as, what did you say? Uh, we're a bit of a think-do tank. Think-do tank. That's my, one of my favorite expressions. <laughs> um, Emily comes from a communications design background um, and actually started working at Reboot as, as such in such position and then evolve into service design after um, having joined SVA um, Design for Social Innovation, yes. um, a program that we're very close to and that um, we, um, we support through AIGA. Um, we have um, Chelsea Molden um, that will join us um, from far Brooklyn. Uh, Chelsea is the executive director of Public Policy Lab, um, a sort of uh, a small firm that has been focused on um, providing better public service um, and collaborating with government agencies to do though to do so, really focused on low income populations and at risk um, Americans. Um, she'll be joining us afterwards. Emily and Chelsea will play the role of respondents. And our guest speaker is Tomas Ives, um, who is based in Chile. Um, Tomas is now working at the government of Chile um, as the head of the design and special projects department. He's uh, trained as an illustrator and happened to have been my student a few years ago at the SVA Impact Design for Social Change program. And I saw him evolve from being a rock and roll illustrator, who is still is, but to then join the government. And we'll talk about this amazing um, multiple hat wearing uh, quality. So with no further ado, I will invite now Tomas to walk us through a fantastic project that I thought could inspire Americans to think about their own constitution and their own democracy. This is really democracy at play. And we're going to discuss in this webcast how design plays a role in really engaging civically various populations, be inclusive in this process, but also really look at like what are those tactics those strategies and those visual tools that can be leveraged to engage in such a conversation. That's not exactly an easy project to do. So Tomas, to you. Hi, everyone. Um, visibly, we're having a little uh, technical issue here. Um, the communication between uh, US and Chile is uh, being uh, problematic. <laughs> so uh, why don't I start with an informal conversation here with Emily Herrick from Reboot, um, who is joining us uh, kindly from the New York office. Um, I think one of the reasons why I wanted, I was very interested in having Reboot involved in this conversation is that, first of all, there's like this practice at Reboot. Um, around social impact and collaborating with a lot of the major development agencies and NGOs around changing um, the way Des uh, changing the way governments uh, really functions, right? And how design can become a sort of strategic tool mm -hmm. to make this happen. So um, I read an article on the on the Reboot website that I, I just got from Panthea Lee, um, the founder of Reboot, mm -hmm. recently, and I thought, wow, this is perfect. Um, I forgot how relevant the, the, all this work that you're doing. So, Emily, you've been involved particularly recently in a, um, a sort of a platform called Open Government Program Partnership. Partnership. Right. Can you tell us about this and, and how it works? And sure. Yeah, I can step back and say a little bit about um, Reboot. So we are uh, an impact 
a social impact firm, like you mentioned earlier, we b work both internationally and domestically. Um, and our work kind of focuses on inclusive governance. Um, we do that by helping governments, nonprofits, international organizations design programs and policies that meet um, their user needs by using user centered design methodologies. And our focus is really on. Um, inclusive governance, accountable governance, and we do that, we've been doing some of that work through the Open Government Partnership. Um, the Open Government, Par Open Government Partnership is an international initiative that governments can apply to be a part of, and what it really, once they are um, accepted, mm -hmm. they are responsible for creating action plans that represent the, um, the ideas of open government. And so open government really means, kind of to those who aren't familiar, um, it's really about how do you make a relationship better between citizens and their um, their government. So we think about that as actually like opening up government. So it's how do you encourage governments to become more transparent, um, more participatory, and how do you help um, citizens really participate in government to hold them to account, to um, make sure that there's a robust dialogue between the citizens and the governments that that serve them. And so we've been, um, we partnered with five sub-national governments, so under the federal government in every country there's uh, different levels of governments from city governments, state governments, um, provincial governments, so we had partnered with five of these governments around the world to really help them develop this co-creation um, action plan. So how can they come together with citizens, with civil society, and with governments to create a set of commitments that really help them become more um, accountable, transparent, and participatory. Um, and so we, we've done that in five different contexts, like I mentioned before, um, anywhere from the city of Austin to the government of Ontario, um, the city of Secondi Takarati, Ghana, um, the state of Jalisco, Mexico, and the county government of, of Algeo, Mariquet. Um, and we really... Yes, in Kenya, excuse me. Um, and we really um, helped them kind of work through some and facilitated this process where they could really come together with citizens and decide what is the most feasible and impactful way to become more open. So one of the questions that comes to mind is, how do you start such a process? I yeah. mean, for a government itself to realize that this is what they need to do and, you know, is there is there a demand from the population? I mean, I imagine often these processes happen as a sort of um, healing process mm -hmm. often within a sort of complicated um, political situations ranging from post-genocide situation to, to yeah. terrorism, civil civil uh, wars. I mean, so what what have been your your experiences so far? Yeah, I think I mean from our work, it, it really depends on the context. If you're working um, with the city of Austin on open government initiatives, it's very different than working with the county of course, uh, yeah. in Kenya. <laughs> and so I think for us, kind of coming in to facilitate, oh, what, first it's like you have to have a government that really is interested in in, in, in these principles, and that's where the gov um, the open government partnership comes in because they already have like kind of self selected to be a part of this partnership, and so what we kind of do to facilitate this process is we really come in and understand kind of the complexity that we're coming into. As a design organization, um, we provided strategic guidance along the way. And so that really first starts with understanding what their political priorities are, what their challenges have been in the past, and what they really want to get out of something that's out of an open government initiative. For example, in, in Kenya, um, the work Open government can can feel a little bit um, like secondary to some of the their more pressing needs, service delivery challenges, infrastructure, making sure that everyone has water. Those seem a little mm -hmm. bit more pressing than maybe like becoming more transparent. So we really wanted to go in and help them understand how to use open government to really a better service delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and so that first um, starts with taking some time to really do some research and understand what what are the priorities of the government and then how to best facilitate um, bringing together citizens and civil society that is really a representative sample of the, mm -hmm. of the context. Mm -hmm. So often in those um, in those engagements with those governments and their various stakeholders, um, technology seems to be playing a, a, an important role, right? And mm -hmm. A key role in some instances, especially in those um, countries in Africa, for instance, where you've worked a lot, um, where the the access to mobile technology is is sort of critical mm -hmm. in in sort of the connections between people. Can you speak to this um, a bit? Yeah. Um, 
I think there's definitely varying levels of technology um, use and desirability when it comes to open government. I think a lot of times it's it's very um, kind of instinctual to think that we should start with technology. I think when we first started working with this county in Kenya, for example, they were really excited about an open data platform, and something that they could put on their, their county website that, that could help them um, push out any of the data that they're creating kind of internally. But when you think about that in context, you're thinking that most people don't have access to um, the internet other than their mobile phone. So how do you really help them see open government not as something that's flashy and technology based, mm -hmm. right. but can be actually improve uh, their lives uh, yes and like service delivery basic. specifically mm -hmm. so for um, for for Kenya kind of taking we kind of asked them well what why do you want this um, open data platform like what is the goal of it and they said that they were getting a lot of citizens that were um, providing feedback around um, service delivery kind of in, through informal channels specifically whatsapp people were whatsapping the governor <laughs> whatsapping um, the director of uh, roads and urban planning and saying like my roads washed out like I need I need information on when it's going to be fixed and how to um, you know how to like access that information and they thought that this open data platform would kind of provide some of that that information After this, um, and so we really helped them kind of kind of take a step back and say, well, maybe what you really need is to build out the WhatsApp feedback mechanism that's uh -huh. already kind of already started in a process to really help citizens have their voices be heard in the government and really have government respond to those needs. Right, the response is always exactly. <laughs> the, the so big work to put in place. So maybe a, it's not a website, but how do you actually make facilitate that connection between government right. and their and yeah, their citizens? Yeah, we we've seen a many many post-its projects where everybody's like putting their wishes and their and their desires on on post-its that somewhat are supposed to go back to the city that they were um, you know that was inviting the conversation, but it, we never know the the, the practice. Um, exactly. Okay, so are we get are we ready? Let's try it again. Chile is back <laughs> with us. Yay! Hola, hola. Are you there? Hola. Okay, super. So we're gonna let you do your your presentation oh. now. Okay, we're gonna start with the video um, of Tomas, and that will give us context for um, launching this constitutionary um, project that Tomas is gonna talk to us about. Una constitución es la madre de las leyes de un Estado. Establece las principales instituciones del país y qué derechos y deberes tendremos las personas. Por eso, la nueva constitución debe construir el techo común de nuestra patria. Y para escribirla, todos y todas somos importantes. 1. Comenzaremos este proceso con una etapa de información cívica constitucional para que todos y todas podamos conversar sobre la nueva constitución que queremos, de acuerdo a los mismos conceptos. 2. Recogeremos todas las voces que conforman nuestra diversidad con diálogo ciudadanos entre marzo y octubre del próximo año. Primero comunales, luego provinciales y finalmente en diálogos regionales. 3. Para que este proceso participativo sea transparente, libre, sin presiones ni distorsiones de ningún tipo, se conformará un Consejo Ciudadano de Observadores que garantiza la etapa de participación. 4. El resultado de estos diálogos participativos compondrán las bases ciudadanas para la nueva Constitución. Con estas bases, la Presidenta de la República dará forma a un proyecto de nueva Constitución, que también recoja lo mejor de la tradición constitucional chilena y que reconozca las obligaciones jurídicas que Chile ha contraído con el mundo. Durante el segundo semestre del 2017, la Presidenta enviará al Congreso este proyecto de nueva Constitución. 5. Para que este cambio constitucional sea posible, es necesario modificar la Constitución actual para que permita su reemplazo. El Congreso será el encargado de decidir cómo y quiénes discutirán la nueva Nueva Constitución. 6. El Congreso tomará la decisión sobre el mecanismo constituyente y discutirá el proyecto de nueva Constitución. Este escogerá entre cuatro alternativas. A. Podrá ser el mismo Congreso, en una comisión compuesta por un grupo de senadores y diputados. B. Una convención constituyente mixta que incluya parlamentarios y ciudadanos. C. Una asamblea constituyente, conformada por un grupo de personas elegidas para elaborar una nueva constitución. D. Un plebiscito donde la ciudadanía elija entre las tres opciones anteriores. 7. Finalmente, una vez debatido y sancionado el proyecto de nueva constitución de acuerdo al mecanismo escogido, la ciudadanía será convocada a un plebiscito para ratificar la propuesta de la nueva constitución. Para Chile. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas Ives, and between December 2000, 
2016 and January 2017, we all Chilean citizens and resident migrants had the chance to be part of this historical uh, part of the building this new constitution. I would like you to present you my experience as the designer in charge for all the visual aspects of this very unique participating process. As you could see in the video, it's, it was kind of complex at the beginning. Uh, we had to take it and transform it into design products to explain people uh, increase participation uh, democracy. So this process uh, underwent for about 14 months and I would like to give you some kind of context for you to understand why this process was necessary. So after the first seven years after the extreme right, right coup d'etat uh, by the dictator Pinochet, uh, he wrote down the 1980 constitution through a referendum without the proper electorally, electoral uh, registries. In addition to that, the political opposition had no access to the media at all. So strong criticism to validity of this election conducted to the 1989 referendum and to the 2005 reform by the president during that time, Ricardo Lagos. But none of this reduces the symbolism of the constitution as a material reminder of the dictatorship on all the suffering that that meant. Why? Because the people never were part of it and it's just a very complex text always imposed from a vote. When Michelle Bachelet returned to the power in 2014, she promised big reforms, including the design and startup of a fully new constitutional process. Uh, her chief of staff, the Home Office Secretary and the Communications Secretary shared the task. The Communications Secretary will have like $1.5 million for the campaign that will educate and stimulate participation. I know it sounds modest, but this is kind of a breakthrough. For example, Pinochet had extensively abuse of the media control to achieve his objectives. To have now a public budget to promote a political reform, it's kind of a new big thing. So the process opens our workplace to apply new communication strategies which we will have to be both effective and also be very cheap. So we began by coding the constitutional language accessible to people and we focused in the set of 37 cardinal virtues which relate the essential easy to understand elements of the constitutions around the world. The first campaign will be focused so in constitutional education. A well-known cartoonist here in Chile called Alberto Mont is hired to present each virtue with animals and humor to reach both old and younger generations. Since each virtue opens the way to a reflection or a meditation, we, saw, we swap it into postcards that resemble a pack of cards, sort of a tarot of the constitution. The postcard will stimulate collectionism and thus become the perfect giveaway for the summer. So our campaign was friendly, funny, and it really worked. So as you can see, people share it on, at the beaches, share it during their summertime, and they have a good time uh, talking about constitution. At the end of the particip at the end of the summer, the, par the participation process had to be had to begin. This is a more complex than voting, as you could see in the, at the video at the, at the, uh, recently. So, since there will be multiple ways of bringing your voice forth. So, on voluntary TV airing, the president announces the participation process and shares 50% of her seven minutes on airtime with this animated video to explain the participation process. This is the first, this is a first timer for the usually rigid Republican addresses of the president on TV. The impact for us as designers was refreshing. 
it was a full animated video for first time on air broadcasted to all Chileans all uh, in the whole country as you can see it's a personal invitation for each and every citizen to be part of one or each and every one of the four steps that are explained in the video are explained in the video you just have to uh, focus on these four questions that concerns values, rights, and duties, and institutions. So after, after that video presentation on live broadcast, we reinforced the six-month, four-step participation process with a printed booklet on a free giveaway software tabloid, uh, sending the, the, the booklet all over Chile. And so, with this publication, or political problems unleashed. So the Council of Citizen Observers, it's a group of people that observing the whole process of refunding the Constitution, complain about the usage of the word new. Because we're not supposed to promote a new Constitution. They mean that perhaps we won't get to that point. So, the expression new constitution is censored out of the campaign and it's deem, deemed as proselytizer. But we were allowed to say a new constitution for Chile, just without the word new. Individual participation uh, start, uh, sorry, individual participation and summoned, uh, summoned gather, gatherings start as soon as this uh, booklet art is published. But they are way more complex than just casting a vote. You have to listen, you have to debate, you have to agree, you have to learn how to, dis to disagree and deal with disagreement. Mm -hmm. So the design lines, formularies, and videos not only to explain the procedure, but to teach Chileans how to be more civic uh, uh, honestly, something that we are not very used to in every way, but by being f using the friendly language of animation, we try to illustrate the diversity and tolerance and, or, and the whole methodology. So, if we can go to the second video, please. Para la Constitución, una conversación. La etapa participativa del proceso constituyente nos invita a expresar qué Constitución queremos para Chile, a través de nuestras opiniones respecto a los valores y principios, derechos, deberes y responsabilidades, y las instituciones del Estado que debiera contemplar. Debes saber que si participas de este proceso, tu opinión quedará registrada e incidirá en la propuesta de cambio constitucional de la Presidenta. ¿Cómo participar? Hay cuatro formas y puedes participar en una o en todas ellas. 1. Participación individual, ingresando a una constitución para chile.cl y respondiendo a la consulta ciudadana. Solo necesitarás tu número de RUN y número de documento. Podrán participar chilenos, extranjeros residentes y también los chilenos residentes en el exterior desde los 14 años de edad. 2. Encuentros locales. Estos pueden ser convocados por cualquier persona o grupo de personas. Debes inscribir tu encuentro local y a sus participantes en la página web o en el número telefónico 600-204-0000, identificando un mínimo de 15 y un máximo de 30 participantes. Cada encuentro contará con un moderador previamente inscrito, elegido por el propio grupo. Al final del encuentro deberás completar el acta, el listado de participantes y una fotografía de las personas que participaron, subiéndolas a una constitución para chile.cl. Podrás participar en un solo encuentro local entre el sábado 23 de abril y el jueves 23 de junio. Los resultados de los encuentros locales de tu provincia fijarán la agenda del Cabildo Provincial. 3. Cabildo Provincial. Es una reunión pública y abierta de ciudadanas y ciudadanos, previamente inscritos, a realizarse en las 54 provincias de Chile el sábado 23 de julio. Este nivel busca que los temas constitucionales prioritarios surgidos de los encuentros locales se manifiesten en una conversación abierta. En cada cabildo se levantará un acta donde se expresarán acuerdos, acuerdos parciales y desacuerdos entre los asistentes. 4. Cabildo regional. 
es el último nivel del proceso de diálogos territoriales. Se realizarán en las 15 capitales regionales el sábado 6 de agosto. Aquí se conocerán los acuerdos definitivos del nivel provincial y se dialogará sobre los acuerdos parciales y desacuerdos para explorar nuevos acuerdos, ahora de carácter regional. La etapa participativa concluirá con la elaboración de un documento denominado Bases Ciudadanas para la Constitución. Este documento incidirá en la propuesta de constitución que la Presidenta de la República presentará al país. Si participas de este proceso, tu opinión será parte de esta constitución debatida en democracia para las nuevas generaciones de ciudadanos. Infórmate de los detalles, inscríbete y participa en una constitución para Chile.cl. Para la constitución, una conversación. So, participation can actually be fun. And you can discuss with other citizens, it's okay, it's fun, it's healing. It's healing the fears of the long dictatorial uh, period. It can be respectful. As the design elements multiply, we set up a main website with all the information. And here we, we will encounter a second problem. Who is in charge of the information flow? In particular, it's output. The chief of staff office works well with the communication office, that it's us. And we will develop a close partnership since, uh, since we have to sportly along the way, think, design, publish, think again, design again, and publish again. But the home office is a technical host. For, a trans for transparency reasons, it's a key to ensure an impartial registration system. And they do not have a rhythm because of security reasons, of course. Well, home office, uh, they have the technical host and they uh, take care all about the security. So keeping all the data uh, as uh, secure as they can. So furthermore, after the new constitution incident, the observers are closely monitoring each and every word we use. So we had to be really careful about the whole materials that we were posting on social networks and uh, the website. So the act of communication itself, it's kind of a attitude of equality. Everyone has the right to speak to the masses, but more important, everyone has the duty to speak to each other. So this logo for the constitution, a conversation of para la Constitución, una conversación, because a powerful logo that branded our whole content during this, uh, during this process. So um, complementary actions are designed for the participation of three minorities too. Uh, in, in that way, uh, we had the constitutional indigenous process that was focused on the nine originary cultures of Chile, the I think process that is it was focused on civic education and constitutional conversations with children and the Chileans abroad program that was focused on the uh, um, to encourage the participation of the more than a million Chileans living overseas. So as soon as the self-summoning gatherings are over, it started ne the next step, the assemblies. So assemblies will be set up at public schools, usually in the range of 300 people, divided in work groups of 20 people. So if you, if you can imagine this, during the dictatorship for 17 years, it was illegal to assemble meetings. And now the government itself is gathering people in spaces. This is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of revolutionary in a way when, you, when we used to speak about it. So we decided to do a plotting one week before the gatherings in Patagonia as a lab test, but we publicly announced it as a lab test. Have you, I don't know if any one of you or listeners, have you ever visited Patagonia? It, it actually a really beautiful place. It's, it looks like a different country. So the experiment itself, it's kind of a marketing device, bringing Patagonia close, closer to the rest of Chile in a leading futuristic, futuristic role. Once we reach the final step, the regional councils, we attempt a technological fit, the simultaneous transmission via streaming of the 16 councils throughout Chile. 
we wanted to communicate the feeling of simultaneous participation and we did not have the budget to do it like uh, uh, via free TV airing and cable or satellite it's not available to any to everyone here in Chile so finally the idea is Chileans can see Chileans everywhere participating with passion respect and equality so we felt like some kind of a sense of maturity growing on the participation period after the regional councils the participation per period was finally over so right now back then sorry a uh, much tedious non audiovisual uh, part of the process unfolds the systematization of the big data 90,000 queries 8,000 gatherings 67 provisional provisional provincial assemblies and 16 regional assemblies will be hard to do and the, pro the approach to that was not digital was analogical so the academy was called for this and as you can uh, as you some of you may know uh, academics dislike cameras publicity and media and it becomes an impossible ta task to coordinate press conferences activities or ev even artifacts to explain people how the big data is being processed and I must assume that we failed to develop an appropriate statics for this stage perhaps perhaps because it's of its uh, analogical approach and the, this was probably the least su successful part of our work the report finally comes to light after three months later than the, than the deadline the president received it and you have to understand it's her who will now write a new constitutional text incorporating the results of the participation stage the president herself guarantees the inclusion of the participation process into the definitive text she will bear this responsibility on her arms the production of several several events unfolds the constitutional process has been a process of collective understanding of equality so the final exhibition with the results uh, given to the, the president it's organized for the president as a gift for his strong personal commit commitment to the whole process. The process has achieved an overall magic graphic style in many ways. It is strived to be memorable. So Chile is moving into other issues like tides, economic growth, politi political turmoil, and the spotlight of the constitutional reform, it's kind of over. Participation can, now, can actually be respectful, respectful and, fine, uh, and fun. As the design elements multiply, we set up a main website with all the information. Sorry. Uh, so the, the self summoning I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I mixed my papers. So, so as an essential rule for any long run campaign, it's timing and rhythm. Those are the essence of, of campaigns. The steps now for 2017 will go back to the boring language of politics. The president, right now, at the end of the month, she must send the reform to the reform mechanism of the Constitution. So, in that way, we need two thirds of the representatives to agree upon an almost impossible task which, require, which requires a new campaign that we are working to. We hold general elections in November 2017 and the political climate is volatile these days as you yourself have experienced in the United States. By the end of the year the president would submit the new constitutional to the new reform mechanism. It will it will be her final act be, be, before her departure from office. So December 2017 feels not only like the end of an intense season, 
but like an upcoming blank page on the Chilean history, a uh, canvas. So we have a year ahead of us to design, to think what to put in that blank canvas. And we are working on that. And, and the pressure to make it happen between now and November is, I imagine, pretty, pretty, pretty big. But Thomas, I have a first question for you. Um, you mentioned values, principles, rights, and duties, and asking the, the participants to really think about what were the institutions that mostly mattered to them. What was, uh, in the experience over the past few months, um, the, the word or the notion that seemed to be the most consensus? Overall, justice. Mm -hmm. It, it has like 57 57% uh, of mentions. It's uh, it, it's awesome. Uh, it at the second place it's democracy. So justice and democracy it's like uh, the main spirit of of a constitution, right? And the people know it. So as long as well, there's other issues like uh, administ uh, administrative issues that involves. Uh, Chilean poli uh, policies uh, like decentralization of the state, etc., that ha also have like this uh, important mentions. But justice and democracy are the top two of the list. And so, what, what we saw in your process is this sort of scaled process where you sort of start with different scale of the region, the, the county, the city, the small region. It's very interesting how it sort of feeds into creating this collective voice. Um, what was the sort of main challenge that you had in, in, in engaging with the indigenous populations? Well, it's, it was about clarifying what will be like the mythology that you had to use during this gatherings and self summon gatherings because it's much more complex than just voting because you have to argue with people you have to uh, talk to people that probably you don't know so we try to do this uh, to create this message to these funny animated characters uh, to tell people okay if you're willing to this you will spend six to eight hours in in a conversation about politics about uh constitution about values etc so convincing people about this is telling people like this is important and we want you to do it and it's much more complex than voting i think that was the kind of the main challenge we had mm -hmm. Chelsea, I remember you told me when you were working with the mayor's office on digital access that uh, the mandate of the mayor was to meet the people where they are, which is sort of a phrase that we often hear um, more recently in, ter in terms of um, creating a social impact that really is inclusive. Can you speak to this experience and, and if you can compare it to the situation you just heard in, in Chile? Yeah, sure. I think. Um in that project, which was a partnership uh, with the New York City Mayor's Office of Digital Strategy. And our task was to develop, to develop a series of guidelines and recommendations for how New York City public agencies could deliver digital services that really speak to the needs of New Yorkers. And interestingly, the idea of meeting people where they are was not something that was in our brief originally. It was something that emerged from our team engaging with New Yorkers to say, what do you require of digital services for them to be valuable for you in your life? Um, and what we heard um, from people, and it's interesting, it, I think it's an echo of this idea of justice and justice being critical to people, is that it wasn't good enough for um, the government of New York City to push out services that were notionally equitable they had to be genuinely equitable, meaning available to all people in their lives as they lived them. Um, that came from a bunch of research that we did specifically targeting marginalized populations and populations who we felt were likely to be disadvantaged when attempting to access digital services. So 
again, I thought it was very interesting that Tomas discussed kind of starting in Patagonia, you know, this idea that you, as a designer who's interested in issues of social equity, you attempt to identify who are the populations who will be both affected by this work that I'm carrying out or the team that I'm working in is carrying out, and then who amongst those people who are going to be affected is least likely to have appropriate access or appropriate power. And you start there. You say, let's begin our process with the people who are least likely to be included if we don't make a point of saying we are going to go to you and ask you about your experience. So for us, looking at digital services in New York City, we said, how do we conduct research with people who don't have digital access? What does it mean to provide a digital service to someone who doesn't have a computer? What is a digital service in that context? What does it mean to provide a digital service to someone who has profound visual impairments so they can't see a screen? What does it mean to provide digital services to someone who not only doesn't speak or read English, but may not speak or read their native spoken tongue? So in all of those instances, we sought out the opportunity to do this collaborative research and policy making process with people who we felt um, were not typically empowered in that conversation. So it was fascinating to hear Tomas talking about their uh, attempts to address some of those same questions in Chile with this obviously much bigger question of the Constitution. Thank you. I mean, I think what comes out of all your experiences is this assumption that um, the engagement, the civic engagement of these various populations is going to start with a very specific topic, in this case, the, the Constitution, in your case, digital strategy, in your case, um, open government. But what I want to hear more about, and maybe I'll start with you, Emily, is how do you start this conversation when you're not sure about the educational level of the population you engage with? Meaning, uh, not just education in general, but the civic level of understanding how these um, entities and these uh, political powers even function. Does that matter? Uh, I, I think it definitely matters. And I think Chelsea spoke about it. Um, sorry, my headphones mm -hmm. on. Uh, spoke about it beautifully. And when you kind of, you have to go and ask them and you kind of understand the, the different ranges of education people have before you're designing a solution, right? You have to really understand the constraints people are operating in, and that includes the, like the, their level of education. And, and um, I think throughout a lot of my work, I think people over, always overestimate how much people know about the civic process. Yeah. And so you kind of, you first, you do your thorough research and you frame your problem accordingly, and then you, you test it continuously. And then that kind of gives you the parameters of how you can kind of design for everyone. Um, but even present to them. Yeah. Like how do you present to them the fact that they're involved in this very complicated conversation of designing their own government? Yeah. I think it's a it's an, an enormous challenge, and I think it, it comes from really testing out different approaches. And I'm sure Thomas can speak to how they engage different, different levels in, in such an intricate process of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I think one answer to that, too, is that you you know, I think all of us would probably decide, describe ourselves as designers who practice a human-centered or user-centered design methodology. So you start from where your users are. So that question of how you describe a process, what you call it, starts by first listening. It doesn't start by me coming in and saying, this is how you should understand what a digital service is. It starts by me coming in and saying, how do you ever try to, you know, interact with the city. You know, you, you ask people about their own lives and their own experiences and you ask them to, to define them on their terms. And by attentively listening, you hear the language they use mm -hmm. and then you use that language to frame the questions that you want to ask and to get at the problems that you're trying to solve by adopting their own vocabulary and their own worldview. Right, and bringing it back to their life experience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I want to focus on one more topic, and unfortunately we had um, a little bit of a delay um, for this webcast, but I think it's a really critical point of this project, 
and quite a symbolic um, demonstration of the power of design, of visual design, of illustration in this case, of craft in this social impact engagement. And we, we are all facing often the, in these user-centered user processes, um, sometimes the design quality, the product, is sort of put at the, at the end or less important. Here, it all started with this animation of this video that you helped develop, Thomas. Um, I, I'm just curious to see how you've leveraged your, your illustrator's background uh, in, in this process. Uh, well, actually, when, when we received all the uh, information for methodology, it was kind of reading Chinese for me. <laughs> so we had to code it and uh, rewrite it and hire some uh, screenwriters to uh, transform it in some kind of uh, manual, like if you were playing some game like, I don't know, Monopoly or stuff like that. Like, if you answer this, you can go to the next level. If you answer this, you can go to the next level. Uh, you, can, you can choose each and every word of these 37 words, etc. So, uh, the, the, the way that we, uh, how, how did we get to say, well, we need an animation video? It was kind of uh, um, trying to uh, call that spirit of, of the games and uh, gatherings and rules, simple rules, and make it a product that it could be uh, printed, it could be uh, televised, it could be uh, shared by social media. Uh, if you if you uh, watch it from the beginning to the end, you kind of understand the whole process. Uh, it make it make it as simple as possible for a constitutional conversation that will take you six to eight hours. <laughs> so that was kind of the inspiration, but that we had to get to the point of doing infographics and animation, mm -hmm. uh, fun animation. You said that you're afraid that now they're going to go back to the boring language of politics. Don't you think? But don't you think that you've had like an incredible pioneering role in, in, in shifting the way things are being told and, and how you tell a story and how you use these strategic tools, the visual tools, as a way to practice democracy? Yeah, well, right now we are trying to figure it out, like how we can put this, this whole uh, back to politics, uh, going back to the Congress, how we can call back to all the people that participate during the constitutional reform uh, process, this big uh, survey, uh, how can we put them back to push this uh, to Congress and to be aware of, of what's going on, to call their senators, to, con uh, to call the people in Congress to say, hey, uh, my word, my, my values, my uh, institutions are on that document, so move on. So let's go to the next step. Like, let's decide how are we going to refund the Constitution. So that, that's the point where we are focusing right now. How can we do it? To do it like in the same way that we, we did this whole process in a fun way, in a democratic way, with a Republican spirit, with, with a democratic spirit, you know? So that, that's where our, our, our issues are focused right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to finish on a sort of personal note um, and ask you all to speak to your personal career pathway. I mean, taking you, Tomas, as the example of like the, the tattooed illustrator that joined the government, I mean, can you tell us about your other life? And then I want to hear about that from Chelsea and, and Emily. Yeah, well, you mean like how did uh, this tattooed illustrator uh, uh, got to the got government? To, to work with the president. Oh, well, uh, as soon as I got back from New York, I started working doing presentations for uh, political programs, like PowerPoint presentations that used to be boring, but I decided <laughs> to add like something like infographic, 
uh, much more as what you can see uh, at the presentation I just made, like uh, move things around, do logos, and create artifacts, like political artifacts, design, designing politics. <laughs> and it turns out that it, I was, it got, we had like success doing that. So that's when they called me back and say, hey, oh, well, we had this special uh, project. Uh, we're doing this whole new team of 25 people. Um, we need them to be focused on the constitution process. And it was like, well, okay, great. It sounds like <laughs> uh, a monster <laughs> coming ahead of me. But anyway, it was uh, super difficult. The political uh, struggle was super difficult too. But anyway, I think that this whole things that we learn and understand as designers, uh, what uh, Chelsea was saying about uh, we don't have to uh, go and put the solutions on the table. We just need to hear, to have a dialogue, and after that we can design a product. So thinking, discussing, designing, testing, designing again, etc. So la conversación. La conversación. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of spirit took me to work with uh, at the uh, palace of government <laughs> with tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. What about you, Chelsea? I know you went to London School of Economics. You were at some point uh, heading a, a bid in Brooklyn. That's correct. Yes, my uh, master's study was in social science and urban design. Um, and when I returned to New York after that program at the LSE, I had the uh, very good experience of working with another not-for-profit not organization here in New York City called the Design Trust for Public Space, which provides strategic design assistance to public agencies who are taking on a range of um, public realm more more built environment uh, projects. So thinking about design in that context of of the public sector's control of the of the of the public realm, um, and that was really my first experience doing work in a government context. And it was just immediately interesting to me that um, the scale on which one can operate um, when one partners with government is remarkable. Um, obviously, there are huge challenges that come with scale. Complexity and speed is obviously not such a great thing often, but, but really the ability to say we can make a thing, a product, a service, an environment, a policy, a constitution, which affects millions upon millions of people is um, a really remarkable experience as a designer. Um, so after that or original bit of my life where I was focused more on thinking about design in the context of the, of the built realm, um, some colleagues and I launched the Public Policy Lab as a not-for-profit, although we, we function a lot like a consultancy, we're actually a nonprofit organization because we feel that our goal is not just to provide design services to governments who are trying to redesign social services, but also to really advocate for the use of design methodologies when governments are thinking about how to improve policy and social service delivery. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I met you first with Sylvia Harris, and at Ooh, that time yes. I was working on an exponential project with my little crazy ambitious ideas, and you said to me, I don't work for free. No way. <laughs> Those agencies, they're going to pay for my services and we'll have some fellows helping them figure oh, yeah. out what exactly they need. I remember that. I think that. there is a danger where designers want to do good work in the world, and we're so motivated by that. And so often, um, particularly more design-naive partners don't actually understand the kind of professional and time requirements of doing really meaningful and professional design work. And so people say, oh, can you just help us with this? And I think that that's um, one is always tempted because you want to be helpful, but at the same time, not only do all of us who are making our lives as professionals in design fields need to pay our own rent, but also I think it's important for government entities to begin to realize this is a professional capacity that one pays for. 
yeah. you would not it's expect work. Yes, you wouldn't expect any other provider of a valuable and meaningful service to necessarily yeah. do the work for, for free. Thank you. All right, one last word for Emily. Quickly. She went from communications design yeah. to service design. Um, yeah, so I started my career working uh, uh, as a communications designer. I'd work um, in book publishing. I've also worked for some um, socially focused branding agencies. I was um, designing um, annual reports and um, collateral for nonprofits. But as a as a graphic designer and a communications designer, I kind of always felt like I was coming in at the end of the process, mm -hmm. kind of putting um, the finishing touches on something that I continually had questions about how the programs or services uh, that I was promoting were really designed. And so I, that kind of constant questioning of how can I get to the front of the, of the process of really the definition and the, um, the, shaping. the shaping and the scoping of solutions kind of always brought me towards um, service design. I didn't really know what it was. I had no kind of understanding of it. But when I started working at Reboot, I um, was hired as a communications designer or a very small team of uh, 20 people over two continents, so really only 11 in the office here in New York. Um, really got a like an, an understanding of how this kind of work was happening. This user-centered design work was really happening at, um, uh, at in, in a government context, kind of internationally as well, and um, was really drawn to it of, of the problem scoping and the and the, and the user-centered design. Um, methodologies, and so uh, kind of in 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 between uh, being hired at Reboot and kind of working on their their, their communications design department, I had gone back to school um, to the School of Visual Arts, the Design for Social Innovation program, and had um, an opportunity to really kind of immerse myself in this kind of type of thinking, and really came out of it um, a much better um, and more well-rounded design. Holistic, yes. <laughs> Holistic design. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, I wanted to finish on these sort of more. Um, background uh, conversations because I think it's important to the overall conversation of design for good and what we're trying to show at AIGA is that there's hope. Uh, there are jobs, there are roles to play, there is an influence you can have at different levels in different ways, um, but these civic engagement projects really show us the potential that design can play and that very simple, seemingly fun, as you call them, uh, Thomas, illustrations actually go really far into um, messaging the value of democracy today. So thank you all for participating today. Um, we'll be pr uh, publishing some additional references and resources on our website. We will be also providing a closed captioned version of this video and clean up all the snafu in between. <laughs> thank you, Lily Smith, for helping us um, produce this webcast again. Thank you, John Snowden, our videographer. Thank you, Thomas, for joining us. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to our sponsors, um, NEA and IBM. And see you in a month for webcast number five. <laughs>